If you've been watching my videos recently, you'll know about this test. It's a bowl made with bronze inclusions, sent to me by Alex Pohl, a blacksmith. I mixed these filings into my normal stoneware clay, threw a bowl, and then eventually coated it in my pale green crackle glaze. And whilst it is an interesting object, it feels at odds with itself. Something isn't right. But hopefully, through this experiment, I'll find something that works better. Something that's a bit more subtle and less disease-ridden. These are the bronze filings I mixed in. And my plan this time is to use not only a new glaze, such as this very simple glossy crimson, which almost matches the bronze inclusions themselves. But I'm also going to be using a new clay, or rather blending what I normally use with something else. And that something is a clay I'm very familiar with, but I haven't used in years. It's called PF690, and it's a very coarse red stoneware. Lisa Hammond, the master potter who I apprenticed with, used this clay body all the time. And it is beautiful. It fires to a dark crimson tone, although it is obscenely messy and it stains everything it touches. And I can't tell you the number of hours I spent tidying this stuff up. What you see isn't what you'll end up with eventually. The stoneware is vibrant at the moment, but once fired, it will dull down considerably. But in combination with the crimson glaze and the bronze specks, I can envision some really lovely pots with molten blots of bronze that are hidden in the surface and with a coarse crimson clay body beneath it. I love how this stuff is double bagged. It's as if they want to make the process of opening the bags up even messier. But in actuality, it's to prevent this stuff from drying out too quickly. As if I remember correctly, pots made with this stuff always seem to turn leather hard extraordinarily fast. So I'm going to be mixing this 50-50 with my normal high iron stoneware clay body that's much smoother. And the reason for that is to hopefully make this clay a bit more stable. As in the past, when this clay was used raw, it had a tendency to crack when it cooled down after firing. As the red clay is so strong, I hope that it won't be too diluted and lose its color, but there's only one way to find out. So here's the bronze I'm using that'll turn red, the crimson glaze, and the red, oops, stoneware. Unfortunately, I just came to the end of a firing cycle, so these pots won't make their way through the kiln for a while. But after having such exciting results with my first batch of mixing metals into my clays, I just had to get the ball rolling. To mix these materials quickly, I placed down alternating slices of each with bronze sprinkled in between them. This massive clay, which is exactly five pounds or 2,267 grams, is then wedged up. And even after just a few seconds of folding, you can see just how rapidly the two bodies blend together. You can see how the layers have been forced into a spiral. They're stretched thinner and thinner. And as the layers get smaller, any air pockets within them are stretched and popped. And yes, it does look like salami. I continue wedging, slicing it through occasionally to see how the blending is coming on. I want the color to be consistent throughout it and for the specks of bronze to be evenly distributed too. There are actually a few methods of making that include this layering of clay. One of them is quite obviously called marbling or there's the Japanese method called nerakomi, which if you don't know about is definitely worth looking up. With the clay now fully mixed, I'll be weighing this clay out into five individual lumps, each one weighing a pound, which is 454 grams. Each piece is then given a quick roll and a slam to incorporate all the pieces of weighed out clay. And now the throwing can begin. And for these tests, I'm going to be making a set of small angular vases, simple, sharp pots, made to be a decorative group. Even with this clay being mixed down by 50%, it's still very rough, a bit like throwing with sandpaper. You'll have to ignore the whooshing and roaring you can hear in the background in these clips. It's been incredibly wet and rainy here lately, and it seems like all my neighbors are having their roofs fixed. When throwing with heavily grogged, coarse clay, the first couple of pulls are always the hardest. The material feels stiff and unresponsive, but once the walls are thin enough and the clay becomes saturated with water, it does become easier to manage. 
for my first couple of pulls, I always apply slightly more pressure, meaning the grog, in this case, bites back. It's also one of those cases that if you spend too long centering or pulling up, the particles of clay themselves are worn away, leaving a groggier, coarser surface, which means it helps, if you can, to work relatively quickly. But if you feel like the lump of clay you're working with is becoming increasingly more coarse, then I suggest scraping away the outer layer of clay, then wetting the lump of clay, and then continue throwing as normal. That's more or less what I'm doing at this stage, really. But in this case, it's done to refine the thrown form to create neater, straighter surfaces and to get rid of the more prominent throwing rings. Scraping away much of the slip will also make the pot dry out faster, and it will make it easier to lift the pot off the wheel with your bare hands. For this process of refinement, I hover the metal edge just over the surface and then I press from the inside out against it. This way I'm not jabbing the metal suddenly into the spinning clay, as doing so will cause the tool to catch, twist and be drawn off centre. Whilst the shapes of these pots will all be different, I want them to be more or less the exact same height. So I set my throwing gauge roughly, just to mark the height, so I have a target to aim for when I'm throwing the rest. I separate the pot from the wheel by dragging a twisted metal wire beneath it, and then with dry hands, I gently cup them around the form and lift away. And then on to the next. When making these collections of pots, I never know exactly which five shapes I'll produce. I just know that each has to be different from the last, whilst conforming to the rule set I've given myself, so that all the pots match, or at least quite obviously reside within the same family. One of those rules is that the bottom half always has to taper to a narrow foot, and another is that the shape of the pot has to be made up from straight planes. There are no curves on these, although the interior form is always a bit softer in terms of appearance. Before each pot is removed from the wheel, I make sure to sponge out any excess water trapped inside. As if this is left in the pot overnight, it can either just create a huge contrast in texture, with the walls being quite firm but the base being incredibly soft. Or, if the base was thrown too thin initially, the water left inside can just eat through it. You can see just how staining this body is, by how it discolours the nails on my fingers. The stoneware I normally use doesn't do this, and I'll be careful about how I reclaim the scrap from making these, as I'd rather it didn't contaminate the rest of my stoneware. Now, you might be wondering about the bronze inclusions, and whether I can feel them or not. And well, with a clay this coarse, they barely even register. I might notice one being dragged across the surface when I press the metal tool against it, but I can honestly barely feel them with my hands. I scrape my hands dry before lifting pots off, like this, as if instead they were covered in slip. I might be able to easily lift the pot up, but when I placed it back down and tried to release my hands, the pot will stick to them, the shape distorting as my hands are pulled away. It's an incredible colour, but it will be more of a crimson brown once fired. I just hope it doesn't make the glaze that's coated over it appear too dark, as I don't want the specks of bronze to be completely overwhelmed and lost. I'll sling some plastic over these overnight, and then the following morning I'll flip them onto their rims so that their bases, which are always going to be damper, have some time to dry out. Two hours later, and it's time to start trimming. I attach each vase onto the wheel head by placing it on a small pad of slip. The pot is then tap centred, which causes the slip and clay and metal to all quickly dry and stick together, holding the pot securely in place. If the rim feels too thick, I'll turn away some material from the inside, and I trim away the internal throwing rings from the top half of the vase. This way they don't distract from the overall shape of the pot. The outside is then refined, the walls thinned, straightened, with my focus being on creating a very sharp corner around the waist of each pot. Again, you might notice that I'm not using my tungsten carbide turning tools to trim these pots. 
It was interesting to read comments responding to how I was fearful about using tungsten on heavily grogged bodies out of fear of them being chipped. My experience is that one trimming tool I've used had a small chunk taken out of the blade, but at the end of the day I can't be sure whether that happened during the trimming or whether it occurred when I placed the tool back in its box and its blade struck another tungsten carbide blade. That could be more likely, but again, I'd rather just not risk it. At the end of the day, it isn't the tools that matter. I can achieve the same level of finish with these cheap ones or the much more expensive tungsten carbide tools. It's experience really that makes the biggest difference. Although I did notice when turning these just how much longer the process took as these blades are more blunt and remove clay at a slower rate. In the past, I used to leave flat bottoms on most of my pots, especially for pieces that typically have flat bases, such as mugs, or vases or teapots. But recently, I've been trimming these very shallow feet to remove a touch more weight from the bottom, but more so to create a slightly more intricate base as compared to just a simple flat bottom. Depending on the glazes I'm using, I can also glaze this foot well too. My crackle glazes tend to go on very thickly, which means that coating a shallow well like this can be precarious, as it leaves very little wiggle room for the glaze to move, whereas the crimson glaze I plan on using goes on in a much thinner layer, so I should be able to get away with it. The last thing I do is just round the rim again with a solid fired pot. Pressing the lugs of clay against the rim to keep the pot in place can distort its shape, but doing this should fix it. To make these quite blunt turning tools work, I tend to use one corner of them. This way I'm only pushing in a very small point of contact, which means that even though the metal is very blunt, it can still easily shave away the leather hard clay. I'll then switch to using the full expanse of the blade when I want to burnish and smooth one of the straight angular sections that make up this pot. Upon watching this video back, the only thing I'm unsure about is if leaving a slightly rough textured surface is a good idea. I burnish the feet of these pots, as those will be the only sections of bare clay left visible once glazed and fired. But it may have been worth burnishing the walls too, as there's a chance the textured surface will affect how neatly the glaze settles on it. So that's another thing I'll find out once I get around to glazing and firing these, which I'm sorry to say probably won't be for two or three months. This month I'm going on a well-deserved holiday for two weeks, and once I'm back in May I'll be preparing for an exhibition and an online shop update which is a process that always takes a couple of weeks to photograph, pack and ship everything out. So if you are interested in acquiring some of my pots, May will be the month. And if you would like to receive a newsletter notification of exactly when that will be, I'll leave a link to that in the description below. The hardest part about turning very groggy clay like this is achieving those sharp, fine edges. And if you've thrown a very delicate rim, you should really try interfering with it as little as possible, as trimming such an even lip again can be tricky due to the sheer amount of grog the clay contains. Inevitably, when turning this material, those coarse grains are dragged out. And if it just so happens that that occurs on the rim, you can easily create damage that's quite difficult to repair. So I try to never directly turn the top of the rim. I trim the sides of it and then bevel those smooth, but the rim isn't like the base, which I can easily smooth, as I can apply considerable force here without having to worry about distorting any fine edge of clay. As I turn downward, I press on the base periodically with my thumb, and I'm looking for movement when I do this. If the base easily bows inward with just a little bit of pressure, then I know I've turned it too finely. But if it feels very solid and there's no movement in it whatsoever, then I know I can probably afford to trim a bit deeper. But again, this can actually be more difficult to judge when you're working with a particularly coarse clay, as they have more strength and are less prone to warping or moving with a gentle touch. If you are unsure, the easiest thing to do is just take the pot off the wheel and to judge its weight by holding it in your hands and by feeling the cross section. I should note that I'm placing all of these on high pressure laminate bats. These are very smooth and they don't warp at all. And as there's no wood grain on them, there's no chance of that imprinting itself on the still relatively soft leather hard clay. And lately I've been placing many of my finished pots on these, whilst they dry out at least. 
it can be quite hard to see the chunks of bronze in these. Here's one, close to the rim, a small metallic shard. And for the next couple of days, I'll let these dry out beneath plastic. This way they dry slowly and are less prone to warping as they do. I hope this video isn't too much of a tease. And trust me, I want to see the finished pots as much as you do, but we're going to have to wait. So until then, thank you so much for taking your time to watch and I'll see you next time.